Welcome to Rad Quarters. Today we'll be talking about ultrasound of ganglion cyst. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this episode is sponsored by Samsung Ultrasound. The beautiful images you're about to see were obtained on a Samsung RS85 Prestige ultrasound unit. I'm going to show you two cases of ganglion cyst of the wrist, highlighting key teaching points throughout, and I'll also review some ultrasound wrist anatomy. So case one, this was a 30-year-old female presenting with a lump on the dorsal side of her wrist. And when imaging wrist structures, it's important to use a high-resolution transducer. Here we're using a 14 megahertz transducer. And throughout this presentation, just to orient you, if I'm showing a sagittal or long axis image, the left-hand side of the image will be the proximal aspect of the patient, and the right-hand side will be the distal aspect. So here we're looking at the dorsal wrist, and there's this lobulated anechoic cystic structure, which appears superficial proximally and then dives deep towards the joint as we move distally. It measures about 2 centimeters. Now let's turn transverse. Here's the cystic structure here. We notice that it's adjacent to the fourth compartment of the dorsal extensor tendons. And as we move distally, notice this posterior acoustic enhancement because it's a fluid-filled structure. It's going more deeply towards the joint space the more distal we get. It measures about 9 millimeters on transverse images. And when we add color Doppler flow, we don't see any internal vascularity, transverse or sagittally. Here we're adding microvascular flow, which can detect slow flow in small caliber vessels, and we see some diminutive septal flow within this structure, but no real solid mass-like flow. It appears primarily cystic. Now let's look at the anatomy in a bit more detail. This is a transverse cine clip that I'm going to show you. So just for orientation, this is the ulnar aspect of the wrist, and this is the radial aspect. Here this bony structure is the radius, this is the ulna, and then notice this little bony ridge at the dorsal aspect of the radius. This bony ridge here, that's known as Lister's tubercle, and that's a great landmark to help orient you to the wrist tendons and other structures about the wrist. So here, this structure immediately ulnar to the Lister's tubercle is the extensor pollicis longus tendon, known as the compartment 3 tendon. This is the compartment 4 tendon, a bit more ulnar to that, a collection of tendons, the extensor digitorum proprius and indices. And then as we move more radially, on the other side of Lister's tubercle here, this is the compartment 2 tendon collection. So this is the extensor carpi radialis brevis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. But for simplicity, let's just call that compartment 2. <laughs> now just some normal anatomy here before we get into that cyst. Notice again, there's the EPL, the compartment 3 tendon. As we move distally, that tendon, since it's headed over to the thumb, will cross over the compartment 2 tendons. So again, there's that EPL crossing over compartment 2 tendon sheath. This is a normal configuration, but it can sometimes cause friction there with fluid buildup. That's known as distal intersection syndrome. But back to the cystic focus at hand in this case. So we're moved back to Lister's tubercle as our home base landmark there. Now we're moving distally. And we can see that the cystic structure appears here in between the compartment 4 tendon sheath and the compartment 2 tendons. And as we go more distally, notice how it dives a bit more deep. And we can even see it has this serpentine configuration extending towards the joint space. So that's a useful feature for the surgeon to know that it's not just a superficial cyst and also where it may be coming from. Now, another important thing to look at whenever you're evaluating for dorsal ganglion cyst is the scaphalunate ligament. So as we move back to Lister's tubercle here, Let's move distally again, and we can see that the scaphoid bone comes into view. Here's the scaphoid bone. So right adjacent to that is the lunate. So the scapholunate ligament, the dorsal band, will be located right here. So you can see a bit of that band right there. It appears intact. We can also do dynamic maneuvers to further evaluate that. We don't see any fluid there. And it also looks like this cyst is not arising from the scapholunate ligament, but a bit more distally at the carpal joint there. Let's review some key points for ganglion cysts, and you can also find these in the episode study notes. So these are viscous mucin-filled collections that lack a synovial lining, and because they don't have synovial lining, they're technically not true cysts. We don't really know what causes these. They may be due to trauma or underlying arthritis, but they most commonly occur at the hand and wrist, and they're the most common wrist mass. Typically, they occur at the dorsum of the wrist, about 60%, and they're often adjacent to the scapholunate ligament, so it's important to interrogate that region. But they can also occur at the volar wrist, including an area between the radial artery and flexor carpi radialis tendon, and I'll discuss that a bit in the next case. They can arise from flexor tendon sheaths, and they can also be associated with the distal interphalangeal joint. 
and they grow out of the tissues surrounding a joint, kind of like a balloon on a stalk, as in this case, and we actually saw a pedicle connecting to the joint. They can also fluctuate in size and may increase and decrease over time. They're usually well-defined and multilocular, but they can be unilocular, and they're hypoechoic to anechoic, often with posterior acoustic enhancement. A key defining feature is that they're non-compressible, and that can help you differentiate from other fluid collections in this region like dorsal joint recess fluid or bursal collections because those will typically collapse with transducer pressure or even wrist movement on dynamic evaluation. And we typically don't see vascular flow within ganglion cysts, but sometimes septations may have some minor vascularity, as in this case. You can also get faked out by pulsation artifacts from the adjacent radial artery, so watch out. All right, let's move on to case two. This was a more complex case. 50-year-old male with a history of a ventral wrist mass, so we're on the other side of the wrist now, also with positive tenel and phalen signs and left-hand numbness and tingling. So those are findings we see with median nerve compression, carpal tunnel syndrome. So here we're scanning the ventral wrist on the ulnar aspect. Again, we're using a high-resolution linear transducer, 14 megahertz. And we see an anechoic, seemingly unilocular, superficial cystic mass here on transverse and sagittal images measuring up to about 1.4 centimeters. When we add color Doppler flow, we don't see any internal vascularity. We've switched now to an even higher resolution transducer, an 18 megahertz transducer, which is excellent for hand and wrist evaluation. We again see no internal vascular flow. However, we do see an adjacent structure of note. What is this? Well, this is the median nerve. And nerves will tend to have a honeycomb appearance with these hypoechoic fascicles surrounded by echogenic connective tissue. Now, if we move a bit more proximally in the wrist, we're still in the ventral aspect, we can see some muscles here. This is the flexor digitorum superficialis muscle. Deep to that is the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. And below that is the pronator quadratus muscle. That's a good landmark because it'll be located transversely between the radius and ulna. And do you see the median nerve here? There it is. So it's located in between these two muscles at this level. And here we have a normal area of the nerve measuring about 5 millimeters squared. Now as we go more distally towards that cystic mass, we can see that the nerve expands quite significantly. Now it has an area of about 14 millimeters squared, so that's abnormal. Generally, a median nerve area increase of 2 millimeters squared or more is considered significant compression. Now we've moved distally. Here we're at the wrist crease, so this is the level of the carpal tunnel. And let me just review some normal anatomic landmarks. So this is the ulnar aspect of the wrist. This is the radial aspect of the wrist. Here we have the pisiform bone, the bony floor of the carpal tunnel, and then this is the scaphoid bone. So you'll see these kind of twin peaks of bony structure here at the proximal aspect of the carpal tunnel. This would be the ulnar artery, and the ulnar nerve would be located right here in between the artery and the pisiform bone. And then this is the flexor carpi radialis tendon, which will sit right on top of the scaphoid. So the scaphoid bone is a good landmark for that tendon. And here we have the median nerve. And this is an, actually an anatomic variant where we have a bifid median nerve where it's split into two. That occurs in about 15% of patients. But you can see that these nerve branches have a normal diameter about three to four millimeters squared. So we don't have any compression at the level of the carpal tunnel. It was more proximal at that cystic mass. Now let's take a look at this on real-time imaging. So here again, we're looking at the transverse view of the wrist. This is the proximal wrist. Again, here's the ulnar aspect. This is the radial side. Here's the pronator quadratus muscle there. This is the median nerve right here. So you can see we're just proximal to that cystic mass. And look at how thickened and enlarged the median nerve is there. Again, we can identify it as the nerve because it has that honeycomb appearance with hypochoic fascicles and the surrounding echogenic perineurium and epineurium. And you can see it's very thickened right there. And then as we move distally, here's the compressing ganglion cyst right here. And then there's the median nerve. And notice how the median nerve then has a normal diameter as we move distal to this cystic mass. Here it is again, proximally. It's thickened, compressed, and then it's decompressed there as we move distal to the mass. Also notice that the ganglion cyst is not unilocular in real-time imaging, but it's actually bilobed. So you can see here it's crossing over the median nerve, and we have this component of the cystic mass. And that's extending radially to this tendon here. This is the flexor carpi radialis tendon. And again, remember I mentioned that these can arrive from the tendon sheath. This one appeared to be arising from the flexor carpi radialis tendon sheath. You can identify this as the flexor carpi radialis because unlike the median nerve, which insinuates ulnarly, this will go straight down towards the wrist until it overlies the scaphoid bone. 
which is right here. Remember, we saw that echogenic mountain peak there? That's the scaphoid bone with the overlying flexor carpi radialis tendon. The other way you can identify this as a tendon and not a nerve is that it has the phenomenon of anisotropy, which is an artifact we typically only see with tendons. Normally, they'll have this bright, echogenic, compact, fibrillar structure when the ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the tendon, but as it dives down and is no longer perpendicular, it becomes hypoechoic. And that's a phenomenon we do not see with nerves. They remain having that honeycomb configuration. And just some other anatomy you can see along the radial aspect of the flexor carpi radialis tendon is the radial artery. Now here we're looking at a sagittal sinai clip. Again, this is proximal and this is distal. And then I'm going to move from the ulnar aspect towards the radial aspect. So here is the ganglion cyst here, compressing the underlying flexor superficialis muscle. And as we move towards the radial aspect, you can see here we're compressing the thickened median nerve here. And then notice then it has a normal diameter just distal to the mass. So this is known as the notch sign. So here's the thickened median nerve, very thick. And then this is the level of that compression. And then the nerve assumes a normal diameter as it moves distally. So known as the notch sign. And that's a phenomenon you'll see with nerve compression anywhere in the body. And then just one last piece of anatomy here. Notice that there's a longitudinally oriented superficial tendon overlying the median nerve. That's the palmaris longus tendon. It overlies the median nerve at this level. All right, just a few key points about this final case. So remember that volar cysts can extend towards the median nerve and may cause carpal tunnel syndrome. But it's important to identify this because if the patient just has routine carpal tunnel release at the level of the wrist crease, that won't relieve the patient's symptoms. In this case, the patient had the cyst resected and had a great result. The median nerve compression symptoms markedly improved. Also, these cysts can sometimes displace or envelop the radial artery, which is an important feature for the surgeon to know. And treatment is watchful waiting. These may just resolve on their own. If they do not, percutaneous ultrasound-guided aspiration and steroid injection may help with ganglion cysts. And ultimately, they may need to go on to excision for definitive treatment. All right, thanks so much for joining me, and I hope you found this educational. Thank you again to our sponsor, Samsung Ultrasound. If you like this lecture, a great free way to support us is to subscribe to the video podcast on Apple or Spotify, or by clicking the subscribe button on YouTube. I also post interesting teaching files throughout the week that you can find by following us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit, or by clicking the YouTube community tab. Until next time, radiology is life.